Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Zvonimir, and thank you very much for uh, inviting me and making the trip from physics to over here. I actually understand that this is actually now the last colloquium of last quarter, as of course, <laughs> not, and not, not the first colloquium of, uh, of the winter quarter, but I guess we'll have to do anyway. So, uh, well, as uh, Zonimir mentioned, I want to tell you about this uh, field of active matter. So what you see here is a tuna vortex, is an example of uh, the type of uh, collective organization, collective motion that you often see in nature on many scales, from uh, fish to birds, uh, uh, down to, say, the structures that appear in the interior of, of living cells. And uh, uh, what has happened over the last maybe 15, 20 years is that uh, um, it has become evident that uh, some of this behavior can actually be explained quantitatively, can be captured by physical models uh, with, uh, um, on the basis of uh, fairly local interaction rules as opposed to, say, long-range uh, signaling or biochemical signaling or so on. And this is what has led to the, the birth or the emergence of this field of active matter that essentially attempts to describe uh, this kind of uh, phenomena using the same kind of ideas and techniques uh, that we use when we describe the organization of non-living materials, phase transitions, somebody was talking about superconductivity and superfluidity and so on. So I'm hoping to convince you today that uh, uh, physics has something to say concretely about this phenomena. Uh, but I will not, I hate to disappoint possibly some of you, I will not really use so much uh, birds and fish as the system we're working on, but uh, rather some uh, um, uh, realizations actually engineered in the labs which are far simpler on which we can actually start making some real models. But I still want to start by showing you a few examples. And actually, the field of active matter was started by the desire of physicists of, to use statistical mechanics to build models to describe bird flocking, such as what you see here. These are 100,000 starlings flying over the stars, the skies of Rome. And as you see, the, uh, the flock is sort of like a soft body, a soft fluid that folds and bends into the sky. And I understand if you go up to the Sedwick Reserve near here, you can actually see some nice examples of these. These are really uh, amazing phenomena. So I'll encourage you to go there if you haven't done so already. Another example, perhaps less familiar, is uh, uh, self-assembly or huddling, as it's called, of emperor penguins in Antarctica. When it gets really cold, these uh, uh, penguins huddle together and form these dense packs. And what is really interesting is actually, if you look at a close-up of the pack up there, what the penguins are doing, they're doing actually small motions with their feet, sort of like vibrate a granular material. And collectively, they generate these waves, sort of like sound waves or phonons, as we call them in physics, which actually provide a mechanism for compatifying the, the pack and propagating possibly information in this kind of systems. So this is penguins behaving as a material, if you like. <laughs> and uh, at a completely different scale, this is a developing embryo of uh, the Drosophila fruit fly from uh, actually the lab of Sebastian. Here, Sebastian Strykan here at UCSB, who makes beautiful movies. And uh, I should say that the penguins, by the way, were an example of a two-dimensional system. And so is this, because this is a layer of cells until the cells at least fold into the third dimension. It's a two-dimensional system, but now on a curved surface. And it's another example of collective migrations. What you see here imaged is the nuclei, are the nuclei of the cells, where these cells essentially have to flow collectively like a fluid during development to get to the right place. And when they get there, Sometimes they have to become more like a solid because they have to be able to support mechanical stresses. So another example of collective organization on a very different scale. All of the systems I will describe in this talk and all of my models will be in two dimensions, uh, sometimes on flat planes, sometimes on curved surfaces, although some of the ideas I will present actually have been seen in three dimensions as well. Now, there are also synthetic systems that exhibit this kind of collective motions. And uh, the first ones that were engineered was done by uh, Ayusman Sen at Penn State quite some time ago. Essentially, these colloidal rods, that just means the rods about a few micron in length, these were gold rods, half-coated with platinum, 
When you immerse them in a solution that contains hydrogen peroxide, you know that if you put hydrogen peroxide on, your, on a wound, it bubbles. So platinum catalyzes the breakdown of hydrogen peroxide and generates uh, phoretic effects, gradients in concentrations and charge, then render these little rods self-propelled. And you see them swimming through the fluid. And actually, I have two movies over here. And the truth is that one of them are these self-propelled micromotors or rods, and the other are bacteria. And I will challenge you to tell me which is which. What do people think? They actually do swim at roughly the same speed as typical bacteria. They change the reorient, they change the direction at a roughly similar rate. So which, which one? Is this the rods or is this the rods? Do you have a vote? How many people think these are the rods? How many people think these are the rods? OK. How many people think these are the rods? OK. Yes, these are the rods. <laughs> 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 but there were a lot of agnostic people in the crowd, <laughs> I have to say. And since uh, Sen uh, started uh, engineering this kind of cell-propelled particles or cell-propelled active colloids, as sometimes we call them, there have been a lot of other realizations uh, in the lab of these kind of cell-propelled systems, including uh, Fluids that flow without applying force, applied forces or pressure gradients. This is in the lab of Zvonimir Dojic uh, when he was back at Brandeis just before he, joined, before he joined UCSB. Plastic beads or colloid that spontaneously assemble in sort of what were called liquid living crystals or that actually flock just like the starlings and the birds under the action of these propulsive forces or swarm of bots that can be programmed to form special patterns and so on. And uh, I will tell you a little bit more about some of these in, in, a, in a minute. So the question as physicists we want to ask, well, I've showed you a bunch of pictures and movies on very different scales, very different systems. What do they have in common? So they are collections of active particles. An active particle, whether a bird, a fish, a bacterium, a cell-propelled colloid or a living cell is essentially a machine that consumes energy, to dissipates energy to generate its own motion. And it does, does so in a sustained way. So it continuously produces entropy, we would say, in, uh, in physics. So an active system is a collection of many such interacting self-driven machines or active particles that organize on multiple scales without a leader and in the presence of noise. It's clearly a non-equilibrium system. It's different from the, the, what really characterizes it is the fact that these particles are driven individually and independently and in a sustained way. So the symmetry is broken locally as opposed to, as opposed to globally as you do when you apply, say, an electric field or at the boundary as you do when you shear a fluid. And as we will see, this actually leads to a really uh, different behavior in this kind of systems. Still, these are collections of interacting things. And so we can, uh, I knew I'd do that. OK. Uh, there are collections of interacting things. And uh, so we can try to describe this kind of organization, this kind of systems, as a new kind of non-equilibrium or active matter in equilibrium we know how to describe organizations with the language of phase transitions. For instance, magnetic moments in, inside the material. When you lower the temperature, they might organize in a state where they on average they point in the same direction. It's a ferromagnetic state. And we can describe the transition between these two states by um, looking at the free energy of the system. So for these active systems or active matter, we can ask a similar kind of questions, such as what kind of states are possible? Can we classify the behaviors and identify generic properties? An interesting question is, what do we tune to change from one change to another? Here, we, ch we tune the temperature. In the systems I will tell you about, temperature is not an important quantity. Density may be important, but there might be other quantities, such as the motility of these cell-driven particles, that actually can tune phase transitions. And uh, of course, uh, in general, we, can also, we also should ask uh, what is the relevance of the system we are looking at. And they, they can have relevance from fields from biological organization, 
to actually design of new materials. One important issue is that, as I said, they're non-equilibrium systems, so we don't have a free energy available to use uh, to describe them, and we must uh, go directly to the dynamics. So what I want to do in this talk is essentially tell you two stories, or maybe two and a quarter stories. The first uh, is about uh, uh, how these uh, active or self-propelled particles can spontaneously assemble without any attractive forces. Usually we think of things that condense or assemble because there are attractive interactions between them. Here it can happen without any attractive interaction, and this is actually a phenomenon that is relevant to colloids and bacteria. And then I want to tell you about active liquid crystals, these fluids that can flow spontaneously without any externally applied forces, and in particular I will tell you about something we call active pneumatics, uh, something that Zvonimir worked a lot on, and if I have time at the end, I will tell you uh, very briefly some interesting phenomena that occurs in the fluids of particles that align sort of ferromagnetically, polar systems, and therefore exhibit flocking. And uh, here are a couple of reviews, in particular this is a rather long one that a group of us wrote uh, a few years ago, if you really, if you want to learn more about the field. Okay, so why is active matter different, to be a little bit more precise? Well, to tell you about that, let me remind you about something that hopefully is actually familiar to everybody, which is the behavior of a Brownian particle. What's a Brownian particle? A Brownian particle is, a, say, a large, that is, micron-sized bead in a fluid, a grain of pollen in air, uh, that, uh, due to thermal fluctuations, undergoes a very random noisy motion, known as Brownian motion. On average, it goes nowhere, but it, has a very, it diffuses around. Now, this is a classical quant particle, so I would describe its dynamics with Newton's law, acceleration. The fluid has two roles. It exerts a mean drag of the particle, and also the fluid molecules exert random kicks on the particle. In all the systems I'm interested in, um, the drag is very large, either because the particles are big or because they swim through a very viscous medium. And so I'm in a regime where inertia is actually negligible compared to drag. And uh, therefore, I will use what's called overdam dynamics, set inertia equal to zero, and simply write down that the drag is equal, in this case, to the forces, which are just the random kicks by the fluid. And the random kicks in uh, a Brownian mm, description of Brownian motion are modeled as just a random force with zero mean and delta correlations in time and the strength proportional to temperature. The higher the temperature, the more kicks this particle gets. Now, if you, uh, this is one particle, you calculate the mean square displacement, you find it to be diffusive, it grows linearly with time as opposed to particles subject to a constant force, the, the square of the displacement work quadratically with time, but in the diffusive system it grows linearly with time. And the diffusion coefficient is given by the Einstein relation, is the temperature divided by the drag. This is actually the simplest example of a fluctuation dissipation theorem. So, Indeed, this particle obeys fluctuation dissipation theorem essentially because the solvent is responsible for both the drag and the random kicks, and the two are balanced. And uh, it, there, in, in another way of saying this, it also obeys something called detail balance, which means, which essentially what guarantees that the system goes to equilibrium a long time. So that's Brownian particle. What about an active particle such as a bacteria? Well, again, it swims to its fluid in a solvent, and so the solvent yields a drag. The solvent also yields the random kicks, but in addition, perhaps by using up some food, uh, the bacterium propels itself to the fluid, and this internally generated drive is much larger than the drive provided by the thermal kicks. So there is no longer this balance between the, the drag and the drive that leads to fluctuation dissipation theorem, Active particles do not obey fluctuation dissipation theorem, do not obey detailed balance or time reversal symmetry as a result. And as I already said, they are driven out of equilibrium, but in a very diff when you put many of these together, the fact that the drive is independent and sustained on each particle 
really changes the collective behavior. So that's really what defines, what defines a native system. So now let's uh, try to model this system. What's the simplest model we can make of what I will call an active Brownian particle? Uh, and this is work that my then postdoc and when Philly did uh, quite some years ago. Um, so again, we neglect inertia. And in addition, we assume that the part there is a propulsive force of constant magnitude directed along a fixed body axis. I attach, so my particle is just a disk in two dimensions, but I attach to it a body axis, and I, I assume there is a fixed propulsive force along the body axis. The direction of the body axis is randomized by noise at a rate one over tau. This is rotational noise, essentially. And that just to highlight the difference between the dynamics of an active Brownian particle and one of a regular Brownian particle, I'm going to show you a movie here from the lab of uh, Paul Chekin at NYU. These are a different example of active colloids, essentially plastic bead, where uh, they have embedded a little piece of hematite. Hematite is a magnetic material that catalyzes the breakdown of hydrogen peroxide, but only when you shine UV light on it. So these are particles where you have the ability to make them active by shining light and then making them just brownian by switching the light off. And the movie will tell you when the particles are active and when they're not. And the idea is to highlight the difference of the dynamics of each particle. So here it is. Now they're brownian particles. They're just jiggling around a little bit due to the collisions with the fluid atoms. But when the light is on, they really swim around just like a bacterium would. Uh, the dynamics becomes persistent Brownian dynamics. They have a persistence length or a persistence time, which is the time over which it, they travel in a straight line before reorienting. And this, so that's the difference. Now, again, this is a single particle. You can calculate anything you want. I will actually just neglect the thermal noise because it's actually small compared to this propulsion. I don't have to, I can keep it. I can calculate the mean square displacements. And I find that a long time, the dynamics is diffusive with a diffusion coefficient that depends on the cell propulsion speed and on the, this re reorientation time. Well, this seems rather boring then because I could just say, well, these active particles are just like hot colloids. I can write down something like a Stokinstein relationship, define an effective temperature, which will go like be not square tau, is much larger than the actual temperature, but there is nothing terribly exciting about this behavior. So, but things change if you add interactions. Now, I'm just going to add repulsive interactions. So now these are beads, and they just, are, if they touch each other, they repel like billiard balls or maybe like soft spheres. Either way, it doesn't, the strength of interaction doesn't matter. I write down, so this uh, stochastic equation I had written down before I call Langevin equations. So I write down a couple of Langevin equations for these particles with cell propulsion, a repulsive interaction. The behavior is characterized, there is a dimensionless number you can define here to quantify what we call activity or how far from equilibrium you are which is called the Peclé number, and is the ratio of the persistence length, the length over which they travel in a straight line between, before being randomized by noise, to the particle size. So if this number is large enough, if you put these particles on a computer and simulate them, what you find is that they condense. And there are no attractive forces here. So they actually, if you wait long enough, the system coarsens and truly phase separates into two bulk phase, a gas, an active gas, and these large uh, regions, the, uh, dense regions, which are actually a liquid. There is still a lot of motion inside, inside these regions. And to anybody who knows anything about colloids or particles or fluids, this is surprising. Fluids need attractive forces to condense. These are just condensing because they're self-propelled, because the only interactions are repulsive. So can we, uh, and again, this was work done by Yao and Fili, and, and there is my penguin, because in some sense, if you look at the penguin from the top, you could say it's like a disc, and so, of course, I haven't done it. Um, and uh, um, so let's try to understand this. 
Well, first of all, you can actually make some simple arguments. So essentially what's happening here, imagine the two of these subpropelled particles collide and they have a long time to reorientation. In fact, that time, let's, say, let's imagine that time is longer than any other time scale in the problem, including the mean free time between collisions. So then other particles will come in before they have time to reorient and they will see the cluster. Another way to, say, to see this is through the kinetic argument associated with this simple picture here. Ah, ah. Okay. I'm a little uncoordinated with these things. Um, which says that essentially the flux in is different from the flux out because the flux in is determined by the density of gas particle and their cell propulsion speed. But in order to get out, particles first have to turn around. And so the flux out is essentially controlled by the reorientation time. And if you balance these two, you actually get a simple estimate for the phase separation. Now, <clears throat> if we go back to our light activated cell propelled colloids from the lab of Paul Chekin, this is actually work done by Jeremy Palacci, who is now at UC San Diego. So you could invite him for a talk. He has some very, very done very nice work. Um, he and, and uh, have a higher density of these colloidal particles. Uh, what you're going to see now is that when the light is on, these particles are indeed aggregate because of their non-equilibrium nature. And as soon as you turn the light off, which will happen, I think, in a second, uh, these clusters, which are here crystalline, actually fall apart. Come on, light off. <laughs> <laughs> the clusters fall apart. They're super, okay, finally light off. <laughs> clusters fall apart. And actually, if you wait long enough before turning the, the light back on, the density will become uniform. The particles will spread out. And there have been, um, this has phenomenon has been seen in uh, several other type of active colloids. And actually can also be, so this kind of physics I'm trying to describe can also be used to describe bacteria aggregation. And actually, we have been working with Josh Shevitz at uh, Princeton to quantify the aggregation of a, of a soil-dwelling bacterium called mixobacteria using this type of models and trying to do so actually quantitatively, predicting, for instance, the coarsening land scales for the cluster and the aggregation regions. And we do have actually a real theory for this that is now called motility-induced phase separation. First of all, there have been large-scale simulations in both two and three dimensions uh, for various types of repulsive interactions. And there is an effective continuum theory that has been derived from by coarse grain in microscopic dynamics. And so we can claim that this tendency of active systems to accumulate, to create density in homogeneities, is a generic phenomenon. And the theory uh, essentially uh, relies on writing down a kinetic equation for the probability density of these active particles at some position r with some orientation theta, including interactions and noise. And then coarse grain in this equation to derive effect what is an effective diffusion equation for the density of active particle that includes both diffusion and convection where essentially the main physics is really very simple is the fact that repulsive interactions renormalize the forward propulsion velocity of these particles. They make it density dependence and they lower it at high density as compared to the bare one. And effectively, this is the same phenomenon that happens when you go shopping on State Street and people start stopping in front of a particularly interesting window. And the more people, uh, the density goes up and the velocity goes down and the crowds form. It's a type of jamming. But actually, you can also show that this uh, diffusion equation that has been derived has a steady state solution where the density goes like one over the effective cell propulsion velocity. And so there is actually a feedback effect. You slow down, density goes up, and vice versa. And uh, it's a true spinodal instability, actually. And it's interesting to see that this is very different from your naive expectations about Brownian motion and diffusion, where a long time you expect equilibrium, which means uniform density everywhere. 
these systems are the opposite. These systems like to make density inhomogeneities. They like to pile up. And that's ubiquitous in all, in all these kind, this kind of systems. And uh, you can actually construct a phase diagram uh, in terms of density or packing fraction. And this axis, the phase diagram looks actually quite similar to that of a liquid gas system. It has a fluid. It has a region of coexistence, phase separation, coexistence of fluid and gas. And actually, the systems also form solid, active solid-like regions that I will not talk about. But this vertical axis, instead of being temperature, is the inverse of this Peclet number that I mentioned before. So the um, down, down here is where the system is most active and, and the phase separates. And uh, what is interesting about this phenomenon, this motility-induced phase separation of MIPS, as people call it, is that it really does offer new opportunity for active self-assembly that are being explored, especially when combined with patterning of the environment. And I'm not going to get to talk about that, but I think if you go and talk to Todd Squires, he might be able to tell you more about this kind, this kind of systems. So what I showed you here is a very simple model repulsive beads that are self-propelled. These systems, by the way, the only way, the only torques are due to rotational diffusion. They don't exert torques on each other. They don't exert torque on the surroundings. They don't align. And for this particular system, we actually have a quite well-developed um, theory. Um, we, have phase, we understand phases. We understand uh, equations of state, constitutive laws, and so on. And in some sense, they are uh, equilibrium-like. We can derive theories that are equilibrium-like, which is actually almost a little bit disappointing. But as soon as you make the interaction more complex and actually add uh, alignment interactions, then things get much more complicated. And, uh, um, and, and really, there is a lot of work to be done, because we really do not know how to construct the statistical mechanics of system with detailed balance. Yes, sorry. Well, I just called it a fluid, and the fluid, there, there is really no difference symmetric from a symmetry point of view between the fluid and the liquid. Yes, there is a gas. And in fact, the gas is very nice. We can calculate everything. So that's especially nice <laughs> so for, for a theorist. Uh, any other question? I should have actually asked people if, uh, yes. So in the experiment I saw by Paul Check in, with the college, it looked that you had an equilibrium actually between a gas phase and a crystalline phase. This is not you're not in that region of the parameter space with fluid gas to existence. Uh, there, are, there are some differences. I use that exp there are some differences in that experiment. So these, uh, uh, in these simulations, uh, the, um, the simulations we did were for so-called polydispersed particles. So they're all different sizes. And uh, the solid, the dense phase here is actually a liquid. It could be a glassy state, but it's a liquid, in meaning you still see a lot of motions. Uh, if you do simulations for a um, monodispersed system all of the same size, you do see crystalline regions, but you also see a lot of grain boundaries when the crystal lines get large, crystal get larger. So I, I was just, okay, th this uh, I had in mind my polydispersed system, but that's what we originally did as a matter of fact. Yes? So in a granular gas, you also have clustering, cooling, clustering. Yeah. And the, the mechanism is different because it has to do with collisional losses. That's right. But I mean, it, it has somewhat the same flavor, and you're also breaking time reversal in the process. So is it possible to map between them somehow? Yeah, I, I'm, aware of, I'm aware of this. And uh, uh, tell you the truth, I haven't really tried. I don't think anybody has actually tried to do that, but that's certainly something we should try to. I don't think you can precisely map them, because as far as I know, uh, there isn't quite as much well, but maybe you can. There isn't quite a, the, the theory here now is much better developed than it has been for granular gases, and I'm not sure exactly why. It's certainly something one should look at. Yes. <laughs> So you can define the temperature, an effective temperature, at the single particle level. 
Uh, and uh, so if you define an effective temperature, for instance, in equilibrium, the effective temperature can be defined as the person sitting behind you knows very well, Letitia <laughs> Cugliandolo, can be defined by taking essentially the ratio of a response function to correlation functions. And what you would like to be is that you get the same temperature when you do different experiments. You probe the response to different quantities, okay? And then allows you to define effective temperatures. In this system, that, that systems that doesn't work. So at the single particle level, you can define an effective temperature. When you go to interacting particles, it really just doesn't work. Vaguely, uh, this quantity, you could think of it almost as an effective temperature, but uh, it's, not, uh, it, it, it's not quantitative. It doesn't work uh, because it becomes state dependent. And if it becomes state dependent, that is not useful. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean by where is the second law of thermodynamics? Uh, if you mean, I mean, the balance, so these are systems that are like systems that have a, a momentum sink because uh, there is, a, a, you know, there is a, a drive, but they are friction, so it's like systems that are in a momentum sink. So. Say it again. Okay, I don't, I don't know exactly what you mean. I mean, there is continuous entropy production in these systems, and uh, that's what drive, maintains the system out of equilibrium. Yeah. Alignment. I have no alignment. These are just, this is a much simpler system. I have just particles that are self-propelled and they only have steric repulsion. They only have repulsive interactions. There is nothing to align them. You need something to align them with each other to, to get. Rods, right? they have oh, rods, if they're rods, then the steric repulsion itself can align them because the repulsion is not symmetric and then, then you can get flocking of rods indeed. Okay, but these are, so we were looking, I mean, we started looking at this system because we were actually looking for like the easy model of active matter, you could call it, okay, these are not spins, but, and, and the, we now feel this is the easy model of active matter. And now the fact that you can understand it and calculate a lot of things for it, it may maybe not look so wonderful to you right now, but in retrospect, it has been a great achievement for the field, actually, to tell you the truth. Okay, so, um, well, let's see if I, well, how I do. Um, oh, and, and for instance, actually, maybe this actually addresses a little bit Jim's question, or at least there are actually two big challenges here. One for the theorist, which is to really do the same type of statistical mechanics when you have more complex interactions. And one perhaps more for the experimentalist, although also for the theorist, understanding how to quantify irreversibility in these systems and how to engineer these micro machines in a way where they, the motility or the activity is actually tunable and controllable. And this is clearly essential if you really want to use this for building materials. But I'd like to change gears a little bit here and uh, move on to um, most active particles are indeed elongated. They're more rod-like than, than beads. Although the colloids often are, are round, but they're elongated. And also they can order in states with orientational order, either nematic order when they are units that are head-tail symmetric. For instance, an example, I'll give you some example, but an example are melanocytes, the cells that shake around pigment in your skin. They go back and forth, but they don't go anywhere on average. So they are head-tail symmetric, they can order in nematic states. And there are actually also uh, particles, many of them, that are not heterosymmetric, so they are more polar, and they order in ferromagnetic states, and these are the ones that exhibit mean flow of flocking. But as we will see, these ones also exhibit a lot of non-equilibrium properties and motions. So I'm going to tell you about active pneumatics, and just one word of what is actually a pneumatic liquid crystal in equilibrium. These are systems that have been studied a lot, if you, have a, um, a liquid, if you have a liquid made of rod-like molecules, 
um, the molecules can actually order, in a on, on average acquire the same orientation. Say so they order in a state that is still a liquid, has no translational order, but has orientational order. And that is called an hematic liquid crystal. So here is my isotropic liquid of rods. You might increase the density or lower the temperature. You get a state where the rods are on average aligned. This is an hematic state. It's different from a ferromagnet because up and down are the same. There is a fundamental symmetry to the system, so the order parameter is more complicated than a vector field. And pneumatic liquid crystals are, for instance, what we is behind all sorts of displays, and they have very interesting anisotropic properties that are exploited in all kinds, all kinds of technology. What about active pneumatics? Well, I'm going to give you a couple of examples here. So this is actually a movie from Zwanui's lab. This is a suspension of microtubule bundles at an oil-water interface. So the active particle here is a bundle of microtubules. Microtubules are long, stiff, rod-like proteins that are inside cells. And here, they are cross-linked by clusters of motor proteins. Motor proteins, again, are inside cells, and they're literally molecular machines that can transform chemical energy into mechanical work and walk along these microtubules, which are, in opposite, which are themselves polar, so they walk in opposite direction along these microtubules, and by doing so, they, sh they shift the two microtubules or the microtubules of the bundles relative to each other, so that the bundle extends, exerts forces on its surroundings, perhaps breaks and reconnect. So the bundle itself is an active unit that pushes out on its environment. And when you put a dense suspension of these bundles together, what you see is a lot of alignment. Here you see in the bundle. And you see these spontaneous flows, which are driven not by the externally applied forces, <coughs> by, by, the motor, by the activity of the motor protein. So they're present as long as the fuel that drives the, um, the motor proteins is present in the system. So you see this kind of almost turbulent-like motion with characteristic alignment and characteristic deformations of the alignment. And we'll come back to that in a minute. And uh, notice that the time scale here, these are minutes and seconds. So these flows are perhaps on the, the motions, the typical velocities are again of the order of tens of microns per second. Another example here is from the lab of Pascal Silberzan and Curie. These are uh, uh, spindle-shaped cells, fibroblasts, confined actually to a circular region. And uh, um, they, they move back and forth, but they don't go anywhere. And because they are long, they tend to orient in pneumatic states. Here is uh, an image of the orientation of the cells. And you see, again, regions of alignment separated by strong inhomogeneities, which are actually, I'll introduce in a minute, what we call topological defects. The time scales are very, very different. These are hours. The cells move much more slowly than the microtubule bundles, but exhibit a rather similar type of dynamics. So that's the kind of system we would like to describe. This is an active pneumatic. It flows spontaneously, and the flow is maintained. Now, as you see here, you see order, you see alignment, but you see also these strong deformations. These are topological defects. Even in equilibrium, we know that order is never perfect. If you take a liquid crystal and quench it from high to low temperature, you're not going to get an order state everywhere. You're going to get order region separated by singularities, regions where the order parameter, in some sense, doesn't know where to point. A good example of a singularity is the cowlick on top of your head, as a matter of fact. Maybe not if you look at <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you were right there. But if you look at the person in front of you, you, <laughs> might, you might see a good example. <laughs> a good example of, uh, of a singularity right there. And the thing about topological defects, they're true fingerprints of the broken symmetry, meaning they depend on the type of symmetry that has been broken. If you have a ferromagnet where the other parameter is a vector, the lowest energy topological defects, examples of them, are asters or monopoles and vortices. These are, uh, are singularities that are characterized by a strength or charge, 
which is the number of 360 degree turns the order parameter, the red vector, has to make to go back to its original position when you circumnavigate the defect. And so this goes around 360 degrees, you circumnavigate of 360 degrees, and you get a charge plus one. In a pneumatic liquid crystal, which is essentially a crystal a order of lines with no head or tail, the lowest energy uh, defects are plus or minus 1f defects, because in this case, your rod line molecule circulates the defects and only has to make under, has to be turned 180 degrees to go back to the original position. So 180 divided by 360 is 1f, that's a plus 1f defect. And this over here is a minus 1f defect. These have the, the fancy name of disclinations, but they're really just like aster and vortices in, in these systems. And if you want to look at some example of these kinations, provided you don't do too much dishwashing, you should look at your fingertips and you see here a minus 1f and a plus 1f defects right on your fingertips. In equilibrium, defects are generated in opposite sign pairs, at least in flat space. They really behave like Coulomb charges. And here we are in two dimensions, so Coulomb charges will of opposite sign will attract with log r potential. They uh, eventually come together, they annihilate, and if you were to wait long enough, eventually you get a perfectly ordered state. Oh, and I just wanted to mention, this is a beautiful article, actually, in the International New York Times by Steven Strogatz on defects, if you want to learn more about defects. Now, in the active pneumatic here, you see that the defects are continuously generated, and the two arrows actually point to the facts that what we see here is a pair of plus and minus 1f defects that look as if they're moving apart from each other, as if they were repelling, which is, so it's like having opposite sign charges repelling, and this is really quite different from what we're used to. And it seems like the defects drive and maintain these turbulent-like flows that actually mimics uh, dynamics you see inside cells. So how can we uh, describe this? Um, what we're going to do here is at a different level, we're going to use continuum equations, sort of field theory kind of equations. We're going to use hydrodynamics. Hydrodynamics of equilibrium liquid crystal is well established and well understood. Essentially, you couple two fields, assuming the system is incompressible, so there is no density, it's fixed. The two fields are the order parameter field, the pneumatic is a tensor, this uh, unit vector n is called the director, it tells you that is the direction of broken symmetry, and uh, the flow velocity, which obeys sort of Navier-Stokes type, type equation. The key point about these equations, which are very complex and rich, as a matter of fact, is that orientation and flow are coupled. Distortions in the orientations generate flows, and flow turn the liquid crystal molecule and distort the orientation. And that's really what's embedded in these kind of equations. Active pneumatic, we need to add something. And what we need to add are the forces that the active units, in, for instance, in the Zvonivis experiments, these extending bundles exert on the surroundings. And that leads to this uh, red term here, which is called an active stress. The active stress is really this quantity which is proportional to the orientation because the forces are exerted along the direction of, of, the, of the bundles, of the microtubule bundles. And uh, these active stresses, of course, uh, come in the Navier-Stokes equations and will generate flow, and there is a complex interplay between the two. And the, I want to tell you about work that was actually done uh, by a very good uh, former student of Syracuse, Luca Jomi, now in the faculty at Leiden, uh, another student, Prashant Misha, and actually with uh, Mark Bowick, who is, who is here in the audience. Now, if you take these equations and just integrate them numerically on a computer, you get a dynamics that looks very much like the one that comes from the experiments. Uh, what is shown here on the right, the color is the vorticity of the flow, and the arrows are the flow velocity. So what you have are counter-rotating vortices separated by regions of strong shear. On this side, the color is the magnitude of the pneumatic order parameter, and the lines are the direction of the director field. The triangles and dots are topological defects, plus and minus 1f, uh, 
And what is in, they're continuously being generated, they move apart, they annihilate. And what is interesting here is that if you look carefully, you see that the defects unbind, plus one, minus one F defects unbind at the boundary between plus or uh, between counter-rotating vortices. So there's a coupling between the topological defects in the vectorial flow field and the topological defects in the uh, pneumatic, in the pneumatic field. Yeah, I'm running a little late. I just want to get at least two. So the question we asked ourselves is, can we describe these dynamics just in terms of the topological defects that really do seem to drive the dynamics? And actually, you can make a fairly simple model here. Go back to the Navier-Stokes equation for the flow velocity. Uh, let's look at the steady state. And let's simply balance the, shear, uh, the viscous stresses with these active stresses. And clearly, this equation tells you that the formations of the order will generate flows and vice versa. So we can actually, a defect is a distortion of the order. So we can actually put in a defect and analytically calculate the flow the defect will generate. Defects is not in equilibrium, sort of behave themselves as particles. They ride along with the flow. So here, what we can argue is that a topological defect shown here, say this is the plus 1f comet-like defect, these are the red lines, it generates a flow which has these two counter-rotating vortices. And we assume that we could actually, this defect actually rides along with the flow it itself generates. And you can calculate that flow, which will be non-zero at the core of the defect. And furthermore, the direction of the velocity at the core depends on the sign of the active forces. The microtubules push out on their environments, and these are called extensile forces. And in this case, this comet-like defect will be driven to move along the direction of its head. But for the cells that actually pull on the environment, then this alpha changes sign, and actually the uh, plus 1f defects will be driven to move in the direction of the tail of the comet. And this is actually seen in the experiment. The minus 1f defects, by symmetry, generates a complicated flow, but by symmetry, clearly, the flow must vanish at the origin. And so the, essentially, this defect, although it is tossed around a little bit by fluctuations, it doesn't on average move. So our idea was that the plus 1f defect behaves like a self-propelled particle and the minus 1f like a dead conventional particle. And what you can do then, you can say, well, let's assume that these behave like particles, one self-propelled and one not, and they interact each other with a known interaction in equilibrium, log r interaction in two dimensions. And then we can write a simple dynamics for the defects. So here is for a non-active uh, non system, the two defects will be like charged particles interacting with the log r potential. So their separation will be controlled by a simple equation that balances drag to the force due to the attractive potential. And in an active system, in addition, you have to include this active backflow because the plus 1f behaves as a self-propelled particle. And what happens is that for certain configurations, the driving force due to the activity can actually overcome the attraction and resemble a repulsive interaction, even though it's not precisely a repulsive interaction. And you can actually simply calculate the time to annihilation from this equation and compare it, which is the solid line here, this formula, and compare it to the time obtained from the numerical solution of the full hydrodynamic equations and this sort of corroborates this picture that these defects can be described as simple self-propelled particles. Uh, this is for a situation where uh, the forces are such that the activity actually shortens the time to annihilation. But conversely, for uh, the uh, situation in Zwolny's experiment, activity can actually overcome Coulomb attraction. And then you will see the two opposite charge defects move apart, just like you see in the experiments. And so this is very nice, but the dynamics of these particles, which are really sort of like, it's like describing per creation from the vacuum and then annihilation again, so they also have to include the creation and annihilation of these point particles. 
So, but luckily, um, it's Vladimir team that with great. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's see. Do we have to start from the beginning? Zvonimir teamed up with Andreas Bausch um, to um, actually um, essentially put this two-dimensional active pneumatic on the surface of a sphere. What they actually did is to um, take a lipid vesicle. Lipid molecules have a head and a tail. The head likes water, the tail does not. So they, if you immerse them in water, they form bilayer, and they actually also form these vesicles. And if you put these uh, uh, microtubule suspension in a lipid vesicle, it actually gets absorbed to the surface, and it forms a two-dimensional pneumatic sheet on the surface of a sphere. Now, these uh, um, in, if you try to put a two pneumatic on the surface of a sphere, as I mentioned order, in, all before, in this case, you, all, you cannot accommodate perfect pneumatic order. You must have defects. In fact, you must have a net plus two topological charge. And in equilibrium, you can actually show that the lowest energy structure is one with four comet-like plus one F defects at the corner of a tetrahedron inscribed by the sphere, much like the structure you have in a baseball. And that's what this, uh, this work actually made the, the cover of science. And uh, I'm not so sure that this is really a good rendition of the experiment, but uh, it looks to me like sort of marzipan on top of an orange. But that's, <laughs> that's what, <laughs> that's what that, uh, that is. But this is an active pneumatic. And so what the four defects do is that they oscillate on a regular basis. So the four defects do form a tetrahedron inscribed by the sphere, but this configuration of the defects oscillates between a tetrahedron up, a planar configuration where the four defects are on the equator, and the tetrahedron down. And you can quantify that, and you find that these oscillations occur at a regular rate, which is controlled by the rate at which the fuel used by the motor protein is consumed, is the rate the ATP consumption. So there is this oscillation that the experimentalists saw in this system. This system almost looks like a self-driven biological clock. It keeps time. Now, you can model this as a collection of four self-propelled particles on the surface of a sphere, self-propelled by activity, but with equilibrium-like interactions. And that's what we did. And uh, we're actually, well, let's skip that. And if you do that, what you find is indeed you find you reproduce the oscillation seen in the experiments. What you actually find, so these four particles are experiencing, they're moving in an energy which is determined by uh, the equilibrium deformation, the, equ by equilibrium uh, known interaction. So you can actually construct the energy landscape. This is an effective energy landscape in terms of some mean angle that measures the difference between tetrahedral and planar configuration. And uh, uh, the minimum here will be, say, the tetrahedron pointing up. The maximum is the, the arrangement where the four particles are arranged along the equator. And then actually, this is symmetric. There will be the other tetrahedron pointing down will be another minimum over here. And so what you see is that uh, the particle slowly climbs towards the maximum and then rapidly falls back towards the minimum. And so you get these characteristic asymmetric oscillations of a period that indeed is controlled inversely by the activity of the system as well as by the size of the system. So let's see. OK, I'm just going to take one more minute, if you don't mind, to uh, tell you about one other thing we did quite recently, which goes back to flux. Because I started with flux, but I really told you nothing about flux. <laughs> Nobody was flocking here. OK, so what about flux? Well, there has been a lot of work on uh, flocking. And essentially, flocking is now fairly well understood um, as a phase transition. But thanks to um, an agent-based model of uh, 
flocking particles as flying spins introduced by Vichek back in 1995, where the mean velocity is an order parameter. You can simulate it. You see a transition from non-zero mean velocity to zero mean velocity. And although it has taken uh, 20 years to figure out that the transition is not continuous but, but first order, uh, this model has, is really quite well understood now. There is also a well-developed effective continuum theory, field theory of flocking, first introduced by Toner and Two just about at the same time, um, that describes the flocking transition in terms of a density field and the velocity, or you could call it almost magnetization field, through continuum equations that are kind of a hybrid or Navier-Stokes equations and equations you will write to describe the relaxation of a magnet, essentially. And clearly, there is a solution, which is the flocking state, where the mean velocity is constant and, and so on. But what we did recently was to actually look what happens if you have flocking on a sphere. Why would we do this? Well, first of all, because we are theorists, frankly. But <laughs> I could try to justify by saying there are many biological instances in which cells migrate on curved surfaces. First of all, for instance, the fruit fly, uh, Sebastian's fruit fly embryo, but also, say, in the in, in epithelium in the intestine and so on, or the cornea and others. Now, if you put a flocking model, the Vichek type model on a sphere, and this is work done by two former postdocs recently, actually, uh, Raskos Kepnek and Silke Henkes, well, of course, you cannot accommodate perfect vector order on a sphere. You'll have two big bold spots, which are actually plus one topological defects, and the flock will form a band around the great circle. So a great, very good students of ours, Suraj Shankar, who just actually finished spending a, a, a semester here as a KITP fellow, took the Toner 2 equation, put them on a sphere, and was able actually to get an analytical steady state solution, which is indeed a band a band where the, both the density and the velocity field are concentrated around the great circle. And what leads to the band is essentially the advection, which acts more like a Coriolis force. It pushes things towards the equator, brought from above and from below. But what is most interesting, as Suraj was, uh, was able to do, is that this system actually supports what you would call topologically protected unidirectional sound waves. The, the Toner 2 model it actually is a fluid, supports sound waves. When you put the model on the sphere, you find that because of the curvature of the sphere, essentially, there is actually a gap to the propagation of sound modes in a region around the equator. And uh, as a result of the combination of the broken time reversal symmetry of the flocking state, the opening up of the gap, and uh, the fact uh, that uh, the advection term does not respect Galilean invariance in the system, you find that there is actually a single, um, so essentially the equator, you have to treat uh, the two hemispheres separately, and the equator acts like the boundary of the system. And there is a propagation gap there, and the single unidirectional sound mode can be excited to propagate just along an equator. And this is topologically protected in the sense that if you were to encounter an obstacle, this mode, well, cannot scatter into the bulk because there is a, sound, a gap to sound propagation in the bulk. It cannot backscatter because time reversal symmetry is broken. And it, you can actually show that it is topologically protected in the sense uh, that there is actually an associated churn number that you can actually calculate. And this is very much like what happens in integer quantum hole systems, in mechanical met metamaterials. A similar effect has been seen in atmospheric waves where the rotation is driven by the rotation of the Earth. And, but I, this is uh, uh, quite unique to, in the sense that this actually is happening in a fluid as opposed to a system with an underlying lattice structure. Anyway, that was very fast, so let me now just try to conclude. So I've tried to tell you about active matter, uh, that there is indeed new physics coming from cell propulsion, phase transitions, new states, new quantities during phase transition. 
I specifically told you two stories about one about active particles that spontaneously organize when passive ones would not, because there are no attractive interactions. And uh, I showed you some of the features of active fluids, active liquid crystals that exhibit uh, spontaneous flows. And I know Zvonimi is working hard to try to figure out how to harness these active flows to produce coherent motion. I just want to mention a couple of other things I'm particularly interested on this day in these days. One is actually sort of calculate things like entropy production in the system, quantify how far from equilibrium they are, relate work and heat to information, kind of things that Jim was actually, uh, issue that, that Jim was actually raising. And the other area in which I'm really working that I haven't talked about, I'm actually working on understanding collective behavior of living cells, understanding tissues as active materials, uh, using models that sort of merge uh, a well-known uh, model using developmental biology with active matter models and that I think are, re are relevant to morphogenesis, wound healing, and in even the physics of cancer. So I'd like to thank you for listening to this uh, long talk, and I would like to leave you with just a picture of my group right now at Syracuse University, and clearly in the summer, not right now, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I should thank uh, my colleague at Syracuse, who are part, actually two of them, I think, are here. So they might both be in the audience. Mark Boyk and Joey Paulson are both here right now, but also Lisa Manning and Jennifer Schwartz. We're part of something called, we call Syracuse Soft and Living Matter program. Uh, this is a list of uh, current, current and former students with whom I'm still collaborating. And I also have had the fortune of working with a number of experimental collaborators. For some reason, I did not list one of you there. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot it. Thank you. So with that, thank you again. And maybe there are a few more questions. No, I, uh, these are just, I, I don't have, no, I don't think it's obvious. Okay. So the, the flow is the flow that that particular distortion of the pneumatic order, which is the defect, generates out of, so that's, uh, I mean, it, it's clear it will be a flow that has where the velocity has to vanish at the center, but indeed, I actually expect it to be three vortices, but six. Maybe you said this and I didn't notice, but when you were doing your pneumatic hydrodynamics with active driving, I, I didn't notice that there was a mass conservation statement in there. Is well, so I assumed it, uh, there is, so I assumed it to be incompressible, okay. and so then you, have to, you let the divergence to velocity equal to zero, and that's, uh, yeah. yeah. But you, in principle, you could actually, you could say, well, these are really, uh, nematic particles in a fluid, and so you should be talking about the density and the density of the nematogens, and, and you can do that, but, yeah. Okay. So in the model that you did, actually, of the, of the defects, of the movement of the defects, you Say it again, in sorry. The model, in the model that you had, actually, of the movement of the defects, you had, actually, you were balancing shear terms with the active term. Yes. But you neglected the gradients and pressure that could be in the system. You did that because it's there, no? I, I neglected the gradient pressure because I'm assuming incompressibility, and so I only look at the uh, rotational part of the, I mean, I, I only look at the, uh, the other thing I neglected, by the way, is that there are also stresses that generate flows due to the gradients of the other parameter, but those are higher order in the gradients, and they also generate what is called backflow, which is actually a well-known concept in liquid crystal physics, but they're much weaker. Oh.
uh, they have been derived from microscopic descriptions. I mean, we actually derived these equations from microscopic descriptions. One problem, though, when you derive something from a microscope, any, any kind of continuum equations like these from a microscopic description, you have to make some approximations. And generally, the approximations you make are uh, either low density or weak interactions. So you can actually derive them from a microscopic description, and then you will have expressions for the parameters. But uh, what you usually do is that you know that the structure is given by symmetry, essentially. And in that case, the parameters are unknown. So you're right, there are unknown parameters. Some of these you take as being sort of measured from equilibrium systems, for instance. Well, you know, I can tell you more about, about each parameters. It's true, that, it's true that the equations contain parameters, and uh, you don't really know what they are. For instance, what is the shear viscosity of a native pneumatic? Um, we don't actually what, know that. What would be a plausible microscopic picture? Say it again. What would be a plausible microscopic picture? Uh, just a rod with a fixed velocity? Or? Uh, so we actually, a uh, long time ago, uh, we actually, no, because this is a pneumatic, right? So you need, one, one possible picture is uh, um, a rod made of two parts that can extend and split and fall apart and then reconnect. A uh, long time ago, we actually derived these equations by actually looking at uh, the kinetic theory of two rods connected by a crosslink that walks along the rods and exchange um, forces between the two rods and, and shifts them relative to each other and so on. So y you can make a very microscopic model like that and actually derive these equations. But you'll have to assume they are at low density, essentially. That's, that's you'll have to do that. Okay, so let's thank Christina again.